Okay. Hello, everybody. This is the 18th of July, and I'm very, very excited to have Dr. Sherry Betts with us today because she's going to talk about exercising for osteoporosis. It's a question that comes up often within my group. How much exercise should I be doing? Is running okay? Is biking okay? Is swimming okay? And she's going to break it all down for us and really show us what's important to do for how long. Um, we're going to go over two of the studies, the study that's ongoing right now and the study that had been published as far as the length of time that people should be exercising. Um, so most of you know me, but I'm just going to do a very, very quick introduction for the new people that we have here. So uh, again, my name is Irma Jennings and I am a holistic bone coach and patient navigator. Uh, so I specialize in bone health, offering 12 years of focused experience, and I provide evidence evidence-based education and personalized guidance for your bone health journey. Um, drawing on my personal triumph of over osteopenia that I was diagnosed in my 50s, I'm in my 70s, um, I feel that I'm uniquely equipped to guide and support you. So Sherry, would you tell us a little bit about you? Just a little bit. As I said, most of the people have read your intro. I'm going to sure. as well. Thank you for having me. I'm always so excited to talk about my favorite topic, which is building bone through exercise and what to do, how often to do it, what types of exercise. And those are the passions that I really keep, uh, keep track of in the research. And I have been the bone health special interest group leader for uh, over 15 years. And I recently retired from that role and I'm just a member now. And um, my main goal was to contribute to the body of research and guidance for physical therapists who are treating patients with osteoporosis. Now that trickled down to the consumer and I got to be part of a working group for the past five years, working on clinical practice guidelines to guide physical therapists in the treatment and management of patients with osteoporosis through exercise. So we wrote two papers that were published last year, and those are the two that I'm going to talk to you about today. I've been a physical therapist for almost 30 years, and I have devoted the majority of that practice to helping people with spine pathologies and building bone strength. I've served on many different boards, many different organizations through American Bone Health, back when it was the foundation for osteoporosis research and education, the NOF which is now the Bone Health and Osteoporosis Foundation. And I have contributed many articles and lectures around the world about this topic. So I'm excited to share with you the latest and greatest information about this topic. So Sarah, what I wanna what, do sorry, is- May yeah, I ask, go ahead. What, what got you involved or so intrigued about the osteoporosis space with exercise? Uh, good question. I was a physical therapist at Robert Wood Johnson Hospital in Hamilton, New Jersey. Oh, that's so and fun. yeah, yeah. And so I was the director of rehab there. And I met a woman who was a nurse that had a back injury and was doing, doing a women's wellness program. She was an OBGYN nurse that was focusing mostly on the GYN aspect of women's health care. And she was running a program where she was inviting speakers on nutrition, pharmacology, exercise. And she wanted me to come in and give a talk on exercise for osteoporosis. I know a little bit about that, but I really didn't know a whole lot. So I did some research to find out what's the best exercise for osteoporosis. And then I met Kathy Ship and Sarah Meeks and some other people who were focusing on osteoporosis. But those two were the only two that I knew of that were doing anything on osteoporosis and exercise at the time. So I took their courses and then I began my career focusing on women's health and building bone density, especially in postmenopausal women. Mm -hmm. So that, that kind of really started my practice. The other aspect of it was that I worked in nursing homes and I saw the sequelae that happened after someone comes into a nursing home with low bone density, fall risk, has falls and has a hip fracture and doesn't regain their, their level of independence. So that was another aspect that led me to this path. Now, how are your bones? They're, they're good. <laughs> yeah. I had my bones tested in at age 31. 
Exactly. And I had about a plus two something, 2.2.2 T score at the time. And then I recently had my bones checked and they are in the normal range. So mm -hmm. I feel very grateful. I had a childhood uh, practicing gymnastics and I was very active as a kid. I played a lot of sports, but I really think the gymnastics was very helpful for helping to build my bone density. I was pretty skinny as a kid and I was definitely on the low end of the weight spectrum and I uh, was tiny. And um, that gymnastics really helped me build a lot of muscle strength and, and the pounding, jumping, tumbling and all of that, I think was really helpful. But I also don't have osteoporosis in my family. So my grandmother didn't have it on either side. And my mother has low bone density, but she's not very active. And so I'm trying to get her more active. She takes my classes and, but she's, it's not in her nature, but she, uh, she, you know, I kind of drag her into the classes and make her exercise as much as I can. So. Fabulous. Okay. So Family is always challenging. <laughs> oh, yes. On many levels. So tell us about yeah. the two studies that you want to reference. Okay. So I'll share my screen here. This is based on a research update on exercise for osteoporosis that I conducted um, a while back and um, a couple just a couple of months ago, and I'm going to be doing another one next week. And I meant to put your group here in the subtitle, but it looks like <laughs> didn't have that. So this is the props I want everyone to gather while I'm talking. See if you can get a broomstick, a 12 by 12 inch plastic or cardboard box. Please no wider than 12 inches in any aspect. And then a few soup cans, water bottles or dumbbells, and two or three paperback books, either very thin to very thick. I'll let you know what we're going to do with those. This is the working group that I mentioned earlier that we worked together for five years, developing clinical practice guidelines, searching through the latest evidence, the highest quality evidence, randomized controlled trials, systematic reviews and meta-analyses to give us the information that we needed to give the best evidence for exercise related to building bone density. We also put together a Delphi consensus that polled physical therapists who, who are experts in the field on how to perform an evaluation of the patient with osteoporosis. These are some of the tests and measures that we suggest that physical therapists perform when they are looking at the patient with osteoporosis, looking at how to measure thoracic kyphosis, the curvature of the spine using a flexible ruler as my colleague Carleen Lindsay is doing here. Definitely wanna be looking at your balance, static and dynamic. And then balance-related outcomes, such as sit to stand, speed, how fast can you get out of chairs, how, how well can you climb stairs, how many flights of stairs can you climb, how far can you walk, how fast can you walk, observational gait analysis, looking at how you're, you're striking the ground and how long are your strides and especially your gait speed. Functional lower extremity strength is something that's also very important to look at when you have low bone density, and you're trying to build strength, which also builds bone. We looked at a document that was published by the Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network that had already summarized some very high quality trials. There were about 55 different exercise trials in this document that gave us information on how to categorize exercise and how to know if exercise was effective for osteoporosis for both postmenopausal women and premenopausal women. This group divide, divided the exercises into five different categories, and, and then there was a combination group. The first category was static weight-bearing exercise, which is standing on one leg, basically, and just standing still and holding your balance for periods of anywhere from 10 seconds to one minute. And it was shown to slow the decline of bone density at the hip in postmenopausal women. It had no effect on premenopausal women. Then there was dynamic weight-bearing exercise with low force, that this is considered to be something like walking or Tai Chi. And this oh. was shown to slow the decline at the lumbar spine, and it did not have an effect on premenopausal women. In the next category is dynamic weight-bearing exercise with high force. So this would be like jumping or jogging or running. And this was not shown to have any effect in postmenopausal women. 
and it was shown to slow the, the decline at the femoral neck in the premenopausal women. Now, what they thought, the authors thought of, uh, that wrote this paper, and what we also think is that there were not very many trials that involved high force exercise. The only one was actually one that I wanted to talk to you guys about was by Christine God. Snow, published God. way back in 2002. And she was looking at weighted vests and jumping programs. And I'll talk a little bit about that when we get to that, that topic. Um, the next category was non-weight bearing exercise with low force. And that's going to be something like Pilates or yoga where you're not standing. So that would be like the yoga poses on the mat and any pose that you're doing or any exercise that you're doing that's not standing. Those don't have any effect on either postmenopausal or premenopausal women. The next category is non-weight bearing exercise with high force. Now this would be like seated exercises at the gym, like leg press, like the leg curls, hamstring curls, leg extensions, the ab ad machine, the rowing machine, the lat pull downs, things like that that you would do in a typical gym circuit. That has been shown to have an effect on both postmenopausal and premenopausal women. And the good news is that a combination of any two of the above exercise types has good effects on both postmenopausal and premenopausal women. So this would mean if you enjoy doing yoga or Pilates and you want to do a Tai Chi program or you want to do, say, a dance program, you can do both of those things and possibly have some effect on your bones. Now, I'm, I've summarized these also and just flipped it for the premenopausal women in the slides here. But what I'd like to do is go further to a a study that I always want to talk about, which is the Lift More trial. Now, this was published in 2018. It was not included in our paper because it was not, we had started the, the research before this was actually published. So it did not cut, make the cutoff for our paper. But I do think it's a very important trial that was conducted by the group led by Belinda Beck at Griffiths University in Brisbane, Australia. They did a high intensity strength training trial for eight months, two times a week for 30 minutes. Each participant that was brought into the group had two months of training of the four exercises that were included with no resistance. So that meant just body weight movement, alignment work. And I thought that was so smart and um, really important because when I am teaching these types of weight training exercises, I see so much variation in performance. And I want to see that people have a really good foundation before they start to do heavy strength training. Mm -hmm. The intervention group consisted of 49 subjects. There were also 52 subjects in the control group. And the intervention group received a warm up of two sets of deadlifts, which I'll show you what that is, at 50 to 70% of one repetition max. This this concept is really important to understand because this is how you're going to determine how much intensity or how much weight you should be lifting. And everybody's going to be a little bit different. When you um, understand the one repetition maximum phenomenon, it means one time you're going to lift an object and that's all you can do. So it's like you lift the, the weight or the box or the barbell one time and that's all you can do. You have to rest to do before you can do the next repetition. If you can do 10 repetitions of something, that's going to get you to around 70 to 80% of one repetition max. If you can do five repetitions of something to get to fatigue, that's going to be around, say, 85% of one rep max. So somewhere between, say, three, two, three, four repetitions is going to be more like the 90 percentile. So what we're trying to do is figure out how many repetitions it takes to get us to fatigue. And we want to get as close as possible to that one repetition maximum as we can safely. So the three exercises that were included in this trial were the deadlift, the back squat, and the overhead press. So the deadlift is basically picking something straight off the floor. The back squat is putting a bar on your back and doing a squat. And then the overhead press is pushing the bar overhead. So they did each of those exercises, five sets of five. The fourth exercise 
was considered to be an impact loading exercise. And it was a pull up where they let go of the bar and drop down. So they pull up, drop down and ho keep holding onto the bar. And then they drop down a few inches and they would increase the amount that they would drop as they got better. And they would progress to a firm flat landing. So they had a little stool that they used to jump up onto the bar because not many people can do a full pull up. So they would assist them with that. And then they would do a drop landing. Now, I do think that there are other ways to do the impact training that are actually pretty effective that I'll share with you too. Okay, so the results were really miraculous. So the lumbar spine increased in the exercise group by 1.2%. And in the femoral neck, I'm sorry, that is not true. It was 2.9%. And um, the high intensity resistance training group increased by 2.9% in the lumbar spine and by 0.3% in the femoral neck after eight months of doing this program twice a week. And then the control group actually lost uh, minus 1.2% in the lumbar spine and they lost 2% in the femoral neck. Now let's go back just for a second because I want to show you what the control group was doing. They were doing stretching, walking, balancing, and low intensity strengthening like heel raises and lunges without resistance. Mm -hmm. So it was more like the type of program that I used to do before I found out about this trial. <laughs> so, and I'll, I'll share with you too, the results that I got when I did a low intensity strengthening program, like a Pilates based program. I would see that people would gain bone density within that first year because I feel like novel stimulus has a, such a good effect on our bones is that when we do something different or new that surprises our bones, our bones respond to that. But then that second year, third year, fourth year of doing the same thing over and over again, our bones start to accommodate to it. And that's how the strength training helps with, with helping your bones to avoid that sort of lack of stimulus or accommodation factor, and you wanna keep surprising your bones in some way. All right, so the other benefits of this trial was increased leg extensor strength, increased back extensor strength, and those are just your back muscles. Timed up and go test improved, which is gait speed, how fast can you walk? Five times sit to stand improved, and that's basically standing up and sitting down in a chair five times as fast as you can. Functional reach test improved, and that's basically standing with your feet together and then reaching forward. Most people can reach about 10 to 12 inches. And then people that can reach, you know, just less than that are going to be more at fall risk. And they also tested vertical jumps. All of those areas improved in every subject. But the most important changes occurred in leg extensor strength, which is so helpful for fall prevention, and back extensor strength. Okay, so one of the things that um, Irma asked me to talk about today was my thoughts on the weighted vest. So I don't actually have a slide on that, but the weighted vest was actually introduced by Christine Snow in, in the around, you know, the late 90s, and she published a trial in 2000 looking at postmenopausal women who had bone loss and wanted to do an exercise program to measure how they did with bone strength. So they did a, a weighted vest exercise with squats and lunges and heel raises, adding resistance. Now, when they did the jumping, they did jumping off of a Reebok step, progressing from four inches to six inches to eight inches, adding the risers as they went along. And they took off the vest for that. So uh, this is where the kind of weighted vest idea kind of got, I think people took it and ran with it and literally ran with it because there are studies and trials, you know, looking, looking at strength training, but nothing has been shown to, uh, or there's been no study that has shown any effects on the walk vest or the weighted vest with walking or running. So that's something that I want, always want to share with people is that I would not recommend that you put on a weighted vest and walk around with it because it's not going to have effect that the effect that you want, it's going to overload a little bit your joints and it could put stress through your joints and it's not really going to have an effect on your, your bone. And what, so what, what I, things that I, I, I wouldn't recommend it for that, but I would recommend it if you hurt your wrist and you want to 
put an extra load through your spine and do some squats and lunges. Ah, so one of the things that I thought without having any kind of training in this regard, but yet my intuitive self said, well, sometimes you have the L1 through four and there's an outlier in there that uh-huh. is negative 3.8. It's like, well, that's going to take on maybe undue stress if you're wearing uh-huh. a weight vest. So that was my, my intuitive thought. I was like, mm, that doesn't feel right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I just don't think that, and there's nothing to show that, that, per, that sustained load over time, uh-huh. Actually, in all of the rat studies, if you they put strain gauges on the rats, tibia and femur, you know, so I know it's sad, but they that's what they do in a lot of the scientific trials to see how a human is going to respond. And mm-hmm. they put strain gauges on the rat and they prolonged strain on the rat, whether it was pushing, pulling, or twisting, did not have good effects, but actually the short burst of high intensity load and stress on the bone did have good results. And so that's where we get the idea that the more uh, powerful, high intensity exercise is gonna have a better effect than more of a prolonged sustained load. Thank you. Okay. 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 So that's my answer about that. Now I have another um, comment with the other question that you had that I have a slide about. So let me go ahead and grab those slides again. So Lou and Fishman did a pilot study in, I want to say 2005, maybe, or 2010, looking at subjects that um, were doing a yoga program. And so I think this is a valiant effort at trying to do the highest quality trial without seeing the subjects, right? So this was an internet recruited group of 741 self-selected patients. They were recruited between 2005 and 2015. So the trial went on for 10 years. It only lasted two years though for each participant. There were about 227 out of that 741 that actually completed the study. And there were 202 women and 25 men in that study. The mean age was about 68. And their DEXA showed that 83% of the subjects had osteoporosis or osteopenia. And they had, what they did was they sent them a DVD of yoga poses to guide the subjects through the poses. Mm -hmm. The poses that were selected were believed to stimulate bone density at the lumbar vertebra, the hip, and the femoral neck. And here's a quote from Dr. Fishman that the yoga poses were selected specifically to produce torque and bending of the proximal femur, the compression of the pelvis and twisting of the lumbar vertebrae. The choice was determined because these are the most common sites of osteoporotic fractures and also the anatomical regions measured by the DEXA scan. However, the osteoporotic fractures frequently occur in the thoracic spine, the forearm and the ribs, but these sites, you don't really look at those in the DEXA scan because there's obviously ribs in the way, sternum in the way when you're trying to look at the thoracic spine. So they look at the lumbar, L1 through four, and then some studies look at the forearm. Most often though, it looks at the femur, the femoral neck specifically, and the lumbar L1 through four vertebra. And so here are the poses that were selected. Now, I don't agree with this revolve triangle. I don't know very many people who have the mobility to get into that position right there. So that spine looks great. If you have an unusual amount of flexibility in the hamstrings here, you probably can do this pose. I have very rarely seen people be able to do this pose like this. Um, I I feel like I can't even do it. And I've been practicing yoga for 30 years (laughs) or more, 40 probably. And then this one, Um, it's almost impossible to get your arm around your leg and wrap around without a lot of thoracic flexion. And then this one too is very challenging to try to bind the pose where you're trying to reach the arms behind you. So I don't necessarily agree with these poses unless someone is completely really, really hypermobile or flexible and can get into those positions without compromising the spine. But what what about about the twisting aspect of that? The twisting aspect. 
the twisting aspect, I really feel like the, t- the ligaments are winding up and compressing the vertebra mm-hmm. and who knows what's too much, right? So no one can measure how much you're rotating. And I don't believe that you should use your arms to provide leverage to rotate your spine more than you can do it actively. Okay. So that, that is expert opinion. That is what my colleagues believe. This is what we you know, recommended in our paper. And also um, Laura John Gregorio and the group from Osteoporosis Canada also makes that recommendation as well. And so I love the tree pose. I think this is fantastic. And you don't have to have your leg like that to get the benefit. So that is a great pose. I think the triangle pose, even if you don't have your hand on the floor, I think that's a great pose and can, can really strengthen the trunk. But I don't think you need to rest your hand on your leg. I think it'd be better if you didn't actually, and to really get into the triangle pose without actually resting your hand on your leg. The warrior two pose, I think that's fine. The side angle pose, I think that's fine. I love this one, but I'd like to see the pillow under the rib cage to support and protect the ribs. This pose is probably fine, but I don't like the fact that the person is going way up on the neck here. And that upper thoracic spine is in a lot of flexion. Right. So I usually recommend that people stay in the shoulder blade down position and even the lowest rib still on the mat position. And then this pose is just a hamstring stretch. I'm not sure what that is doing for any bone. You know, that's the same thing too. There's no real loading through here. This number eight and nine, they're fine. But I, I wouldn't think they would have any effect on building bone. And then the Shavasana. I do think this can have an effect on bone because we know that cortisol, elevated cortisol is actually a a bone eater, (laughs) you know? So if you can balance your cortisol and serotonin, then you might have better effects with all of your activities. The, you'll sleep better, your serotonin levels higher and cortisol lower is gonna help you with obviously your sleep and your stress management. And I think that can have an indirect effect on your bone by calming your nervous system, activating the parasympathetic nervous system and calming down the sympathetic nervous system by doing deep breathing or meditation or Shavasana. So I do like that one. So go on to right. number so, six before we move on, Cherry. So you're okay. This number six is okay if you have a pillow underneath here to protect. The I rib. love that one, except for mm-hmm. I'd, I'd rather see a pillow underneath. Yes. Underneath the ribs. Mm-hmm. Great. Okay. Yeah. I, and I can, actually, de- I can demonstrate that. Okay. I had so to, if I'm, are you your I'm here okay. mm-hmm. and the problem is I, I know of people who have had fractures from doing these types of exercises where their ribs are, are really having a lot of pressure on the mat and there's a hard floor underneath. So I think it is really helpful to put a pillow under your ribs, put your pubic bone on the pillow. It also helps to elongate your low back. And then you can start doing some exercises like this in Mm -hmm. different arm positions. And I like even doing arms and legs out like that. That's going to work the entire back. And that I think will help strengthen the back, restore posture, reduce curvature in the spine, and then possibly build bone density as well. Great. That was very, very helpful. Yeah. Uh, just to let you know, I okay. did participate early on in Dr. Fishman's study. Mm-hmm. Uh, I actually went to see him because I was very curious about it. I was mm-hmm. surprised that there wasn't a certified densitometrist that was looking at the DEXs. So mm-hmm. I I just backed away from it because I didn't think that it was done well. That was no. my opinion from my experience. No, I felt the same. Mm-hmm. I think it was a valiant effort but it's a bit messy. So, right. <laughs> and, and there's, you, they never saw any of the people. So no, no one knows how they were doing with mm-hmm. the poses. They were all self-reported. So they just gave them surveys and they responded to surveys. And it would have been really cool if you would have went ahead and participated just to kind of see how it went, you know, <laughs> that would have been really cool. Yeah. Because as you said, it was a, it was a good effort, a really good effort because uh-huh. you don't want to throw the yoga baby bath out with water, right? Kind of thing because That's yoga. Right, right. Kind of I it. totally right. agree because I think the yoga poses. Um, let me grab something. I'll show you, and I'll put it up on the screen. Um, this is a handout that I created for 
the National Osteoporosis Foundation. And it's something that we had been dreaming of for a long time. And we you know what are the yoga poses that are recommended? Mm -hmm. And this is something you can get off my website or you can get it off the NOF website. It's now known as BHOF, sorry. <laughs> and those are my favorite poses right there. So it does include some of the ones from Dr. Fishman's study. Mm -hmm. And so I, um, those are some of my favorites. These are the, these are the ones I think you should avoid. And so the forward bending, the rounding of the back, the deep twist with using leverage mm -hmm. to rotate and the, the deep hip stretches with your body weight coming down through the hip. If somebody's really flexible, they can probably do that. And then I, I'm not a fan of warrior one because I think it's almost biomechanically impossible. Really? And you always have to watch overpressure from teachers. Yes. Well, I'm yeah. thrilled that you don't mm -hmm. like a pigeon pose because who does? That's just yeah. <laughs> Some people love it. And, you know, a lot of times when I tell somebody that they, they shouldn't be doing a pose, it's like, oh, I love that one. You know, so it's, yes. you know but I always help them find a way to do it safely mm -hmm. and to give them some guidelines for how they can do it and do something that feels as good and as safe. Okay. Um, so, I don't like uh, to take things away from people. I like to give things to people. <laughs> great approach. Right. Um, so before <laughs> we move quickly, and we're going to move quickly, I'm going to stop the recording. I'm going to restart again. Um, any opinion about Osteo Strong? I mean, I know I'm throwing you a curveball, and I don't know if you know. Yes, it's okay. I'm used to it. Um, yes, Osteo Strong. Well, there is, there is a study that actually looked at the Lift More program versus Osteo Strong, yeah. and the Lift More program actually won out. There were actually injuries in the Osteo Strong program. I have seen injuries in the Osteo Strong, the intermittent axial compression program, where, the, where you're doing one repetition, pushing, pulling, lifting as hard as you can, mm -hmm. and you have feedback on the screen, and it, it's it makes sense because it's, it's based on the one repetition max concept and you are trying to do as hard as you can one repetition. So it, it's based on that one repetition maximum concept. The problem is if you've never done strength training before and you go in and you do that, I think the risk for injuring yourself is high. Mm -hmm. And so one time a week, it, and actually in the study in the Liftmore trial, because the osteostrong people tell you one time a week is what you need to do. And the Liftmore trial actually did two times a week because they were doing two times a week and they wanted the study to be more equal. So they had the osteostrong group do two times a week and the Liftmore people do two times a week. And the Liftmore trial actually did show better results. Okay. So I, they don't have any randomized control trials and the trials they are quoting on their on their website are not not their program. It's it's something other than what they're actually doing. So I don't agree with that. And they're they're very defensive about it. <laughs> and so I, yeah. I did I did walk into a studio and I said, so tell me, do you have a certified densitometrist here who reads the DEXAs because you're comparing DEXAs? And she said, what? So I yeah. thought, oh, okay. Okay. So we right. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So again, not, not great. Um, really scientifically rigorous research. Okay. All right. A lot so, of marketing. <laughs> Irma, there are some questions. I don't know if you want them now before you move to the exercise portion. Up, what do you think? Up to what you. Is, up to you. Let's see if we could do this quickly. How do I increase my weights to one rep fatigue without causing stress fractures? Okay. I'm not sure what one rep fatigue means, but you don't want to go to one repetition maximum. So please don't, don't think that I'm saying that. I'm so glad you asked that question because I'm not saying you're doing one repetition at your maximum ability. That is not safe. And I would never recommend that. So what we do when we get started is we try, let me just back up in rehab. So say you've got an injury or a fracture and you want to get better. You do body weight only first then you start adding one pound at a time. So that means this, this is a perfect segue into the exercise portion because the first thing I'm gonna have you do, if you have wait, an injury or a compression yeah. fracture. Are, are we is, going into that? Are we going into the exercise? Well, maybe not because I okay. think you're gonna stop the recording and, and redo stop it. The recording. So let me just say it verbally okay. then. Okay, so first thing you're gonna do is learn how to do that hip hinge 
without bending your spine forward, without compressing the vertebral body. Then you're going to get an empty box and try to lift it without compromising your spine alignment. And then you're going to put one pound in that box and you're going to do 10 times. Then you're going to go up to 15 times. And so if you have pain, you don't do any weight, right? If, you're, if something is causing pain, you don't do any weights. You do body weight only until you get stronger and to make sure your pain level doesn't go up, okay? So let's say you don't have pain and you wanna get stronger. You start putting that one pound in the box. You do 10 repetitions. Can I at least make it to 10? Then can I go to 15? Once I can do 15 reps, I know that I'm getting into the lower intensity zone. So that means that it's like 50 to 70% of one repetition maximum. And my intensity is dropping. It's not gonna be as effective for bone building. I'm gonna go up. So I'm gonna put another pound in that box. And then the next set, I'm gonna see how that feels. Can I do 15? No, I can only do 12. So I'm gonna stay there, right? So maybe you're just doing a two pound box lift at first. And then the next workout, you, you're gonna try again, do that same amount, and then go up again on the weight. So this is something I'm gonna probably repeat as we go along, but you go up one pound at a time and you make sure that that spine is in alignment and it's not being compromised. Now, which means... <laughs> oh, good, thank you. <laughs> which means that your head can touch a, a vertical line or a dowel, head, mid-back, and sacrum and that you're not bending like this to pick something up because when you bend like that to pick something up that compresses the vertebral bodies in the front of the spine so if you can hinge at the hip and keep that spine in alignment without any compromise if you have a compression fracture right here you're going to protect that vertebra because if you bend like this and add a load your vertebra above and below that compression fracture is at great risk for fracture right so you want to learn and I'm hoping today that before you leave this program that you're gonna have a great idea of how to do a hip hinge and how to keep your spine in alignment so that you can pick something up off the floor and not hurt yourself. Fabulous, fabulous. Right? Okay, before okay. we jump into exercise, a very fast question on Meridine. Have you looked at that at all? Yes, definitely. Definitely. Um, I've actually spoken to Clint, Clint Rubin about it and written to him about it. And um, so the Meridine platform is a vibration platform that is low intensity vibration. If, if you've ever heard of the power plate, that's a very high intensity vibration platform. And it has some research behind it, but Clint Rubin being an expert in the field, he used to develop vibration platforms for astronauts who would go out in space and lose bone density. So he was trying to figure out ways to keep their bones healthy with the low gravity environment. And then um, developed the LIV platform. And he is thinking that this platform is going to have good effects on building bone. And Belinda Beck and he have teamed up and they're, they have completed the trial. It's called the Vibe More trial. And they are comparing the Lift More program to the Vibration program. Oh, and they're going to see if one is better than the other, mm -hmm. or if adding the vibration to the lift more subjects that do the heavy intensity, uh, high intensity strength training have better effects. So we're just trying to, they're just trying to see what the effects are of adding the vibration platform and also comparing it. Okay. And I have not recommended people to buy a Mar Maradine yet. I, I think if you have the means to do it, it's not, it won't hurt you. You can get on there and you want to get on it for like 10 minutes and then 10 minutes a day. And then within two hours, you should do your exercises because what it does is it, it vibrates the cell, the osteoblast and makes it more responsive to stimulus. So you're basically waking up your cells and then two hours later you go exercise. So if I were to recommend it, that's the protocol that I would suggest that you use which is recommended by Clint Rubin. So just, I did buy one. I've been using it. I love mm -hmm. it. Um, I feel mm -hmm. that my body is saying thank you on many different levels, but we'll see mm -hmm. how it goes. Yeah. And so what I call the, um, the low tech version and the low cost version of the vibration platform is the jumping program that I've been doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'll show you how to 
how to get started okay. with that if you want to start okay. doing some jumping. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna end the call right. here.